there have been a few things happening in the world of EAS these days. You might ask why we have that coming up. Well, we don't know anything about EAS. Well, no, we don't, but this is how we learn things, right? We're really fortunate to have uh, Bill Robertson. Did I get it right, Bill? Yep. Oh, thank God. Um, <laughs> Vice President of Digital Alert Systems with us. Is Ed? Ed's here, too. Hey, Ed Chernecki, also here. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mike is yours, gentlemen. Clicker there. Just keep on going forward. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Clicker thing going. And forward. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you guys today. Uh, the topic of our presentation you'll see actually inside the uh, uh, booth guide with Nautel is EAS at the edge. Ah, what does that mean? Well, I'll let Ed take it over. Well, good morning. I'm not really going to take it over. I'll just do a little color commentary. Um, for those of you who don't know us, Bill Robertson is the Vice President of Business Development with Digital Earth Systems, um, but he's a lot more than that. He's uh, basically a de facto CIO, CTO of the company. Uh, I'm Vice President of Global and Government Affairs, which is a hugely overblown title, but I get to do everything Bill doesn't want to do. Um, we, uh, we came here to talk about the first thing you got to want to hear in the morning. Yeah, yes, I know, thrilling subject, but I think what we've got to talk about is really cool. I'm not a marketing guy, so I won't throw out things like a game changer or a paradigm shifter. I'll leave up that up to you guys, but it is truly really cool. Um, virtualization is the big buzzword, has been the big buzzword for a number of years now, and there's no arguing. Virtualization of serv certain services provide possibilities that can save, uh, provide cost savings, provide new types of function functionality. But for those of us who actually have been involved in supporting virtualization of services in cable TV, in IPTV, which is two of our core market areas, in national security, military, public safety applications, it's been broadly acknowledged for years that virtualization has its limits, particularly when it runs into the wall of regulatory, security, operational, and other physical considerations. So um, what, we've, what we've run into, not unexpectedly, is that the emergency alert system is exactly this kind of search situation. But we're, ha we're here to talk about a hybrid approach. There is a, uh, there is a solution, there is an approach that can get the, deliver the benefits of virtualization while still factoring in the realities of the FCC, of FEMA, of CISA, a whole bunch of agencies you don't even want to know about, uh, as well as the physical realities we just can't change. What we're going to talk about, like I said, is it, pretty cool. It, and I, I, Bill's cringing here, I'm, over, I'm, I'm, I'm underselling it. But it has its applications for those of you in the radio industry who are transitional AOIP, for those of you who are looking at virtualizing your remote station operations, for those of you who are looking at geocasting, for those of you who are public broadcasters looking at the next generation warning systems grant, this has specific relevance to all those areas. Bill. So to start off, we want to kind of look at what it really was referred to as a traditional air chain. If you look at this thing in the context of where the EAS box lives, it lives in the air chain, which means it's really supposed to be the last switching device. There may be other processes that happen, but remember, it's the last device that switches the program. If you've got all of your other things, typically that EAS box is supposed to be that last switch element. This is going to be important when we start talking about how this uh, hybrid approach works. So first off, one of the things that you have is this EAS at the edge, which is a service mark that we've kind of coined in, in our uh, collective group here, is that it combines the elements of virtualization, but it puts it in the playback chain in a different way. So the big thing around it is there are some key architectural elements of this thing. We want to capture the EAS off the air at the edge. This is an important thing. Think of it in the same context of a microphone. You've got that analog input into whatever digital process that you've got. You've got to have that analog input. You've got to have the speaker. You can't virtualize those elements. You've got to have those transducers that convert the analog world into the digital world and conversely digital into the analog world. 
There's critical processing that has to happen in there at the points of reception and everything. So there's a real important thing that we've got all of these, these elements working. Part of it too is placing the processing that you need for those elements at the appropriate point. And that's a big thing around it is we want to be able to take this information and get it into a digital format. We want to be able to take this and create audio over IP that we can put into the air chain. And we want to be able to, to distribute it to the end point for distribution. So one of the things we have is this simple model. And there's three elements in the simple model. You've got the input, you've got the routing, and you've got the output. Very straightforward. There's nothing really magical about this. The magic happens of how you deal with those particular things. Again, the input side of it is we want to have the device, the EAS device, at the edge of the network where we can receive the off-air signals, we can do the, the input to the, the cap processing, the filtering, everything that we need to do at that edge. Then what we do is then tightly couple this with the ability to take this air chain and convert it into a IO, uh, uh, audio over IP, an AES67. But here's an important thing, you just can't take and convert the audio into AES67 and say, oh, here it is in my air chain. Why? Well, part of it is you've got to have that routing information. The critical thing about it is if I just hook up a dongle and say, oh, look, I've got AES67, it's insufficient in the air chain because it needs to know where to go. What's the endpoint? That is a critical thing around it. So in our particular world, what we've done is we've added AES67, but the live wire plus routing protocol so that we have the information. Now these are, think about this. This is two protocols, one AES67. The second one is live wire routing so that we can say where the destination point for this information is supposed to go. So it's very, very critical when you look at this. Now we take that simple model, let's blow it back up into a more uh, expanded signal flow. If you'll notice here, we've got the audio playout but the EAS device still remains separate. Remember, that's the, the critical part of part of the edge of this particular network is it remains a separate device. But what we're doing is sending audio over IP into the live wire device and the routing information, which means that if I've got two signals coming in, we assert ourselves as being the trigger. In other words, in the same way that the, the analog system that you had or the, the, the uh, EAS system in the past, we're now saying, hey, we're going to be the master. We can't, we can't be in a system where faders are set or anything else like that. So what's nice about the way that we've implemented this is we monitor that live wire device. If another automation, and this is an important thing too, key thing is that you don't want automation to override it or a, a talent to override that. You need to monitor it. So if something else tries to step on it, we reassert it and make sure that if, when we're playing EAS, it always goes out. So if you look at that, there's actually a bi-directional area, which is a little bit you know, tight in there, because we're constantly monitoring. If something else tries to modify our output, we come back in and step on it and say, no, we're going to be the master. This is a critical part. This is why, again, you can't just put an AES67 dongle on this thing and expect it to work. You have to have the control logic that makes that, that work. So the other thing is, when you look at this, there's another consideration in this air chain. And one of it items has to do with the PPM. If you are encoding PPM, and let's say the originating signal, okay, the, the, uh, maybe the PEP station or anything else, where you originate it, you receive it and it's got the watermark already built into it. You don't want to take your output and add an additional watermark to it. That's not good. Double encoding is not what you want to do. So this becomes another thing. Oh, wait a minute. If I'm going to be playing this thing and I've got something else, what I really want to do is send a signal to the PPM and say, don't. I want you to go into bypass when I'm playing an EAS event to avoid double encoding. This is, an, again, when you look at this air chain and, and the elements that you are dealing with, you want to make sure you've got all of the different things that are going on. So part of it now, we've got, let's assert ourselves on the, on the live wire device, but let's also make sure that the PPM is turned off if the, we've got a watermark on the input. Taking it even further, now we move out through this air chain. Again, we're going back and looking at this entire air chain. So we've got the live wire device and we're controlling that. We've got the PPM encoder that says, oh, wait a minute, we don't want PPM on this thing, so we want to shut that off so we don't double encode. The next thing is, why not tell the audio processor, this is EAS. Change to a preset that is compatible with 
the voice that you're going to get on an EAS event. We don't need, this is not going to be fancy stereo, it's not going to have a lot of dynamic range, this is a voice. That's typically all you're going to get out of it, so let's preset the audio processor to give us what we really want in the best possible way for EAS. Further, now we add a third element into this thing, and that's the metadata. There's another component here in the RDS side. And what's interesting that we can do is we can add additional metadata in here to the RDS by sending the text value of the alert. So now on the displays in the RDS, you can have the text of the alert. Think about this, you know, Paul kind of mentioned, you know, TV for, for, uh, for a car, but now you've got something that is really kind of an important element of your presentation. Part of it is because obviously you have to do the audio interrupt, and that's going to be the wonk, 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 and it's going to be there. But if somebody comes out of the mall and they, t they turn on their, their, uh, their car, and as they're going away, that will persist. In other words, the event is not just over after the audio is over. If it's a tornado warning, it might be for 30 minutes. Why not give the, the, uh, the person that turns on their car after the, uh, the audio came out, give them information about that? This is kind of the critical thing around this, that you've got all of these different elements. There's more, too. And in fact, part of the stuff that we're going to showcase is, uh, on the Nautel booth is adding even more information in this metadata space, where we can get even more information. So in essence, what we've done now is added a third protocol. AES67 as the first one, Livewire routing protocol, and EASnet, which is the metadata interface between these particular devices. So when we take this a little bit further, what's interesting is these individual boxes, these elements that you see here, are not necessarily physical hardware. But what's nice is, for example, we're working and partnering with the TELUS group, the Omnia 9 processor actually encompasses four of these particular blocks in one device. So what's neat about this is that we have the hardware on one side, the processor has all of these other elements into it, and we can talk directly to that device. So it really becomes an interesting element about being able to combine these multiple protocols and be able to present them in such a way that all these different things can happen in that particular device. Let's take it one step further. If you look at the Nautel GV, this combines all of those elements, including an additional part, which is very important because all of the HD signals and all of the time synchronization for all of the multiple HDs that you may want are all combined in the GV transmitter. You've got the processor, you've got all the other elements, and we've added a, th a third piece, if you will, to this whole presentation. Part of it is that additional metadata, instead of having the, the uh, album art or anything else like that, the Nautel guys have used our what we call VIDs, or Visually Integrated Display Symbology, which is a, a group of symbols that we pioneered along with FEMA and other groups to give you a representation of what the alert looks like. So it's not complex, and it's not meant to be complex, but you get a graphic symbol that pops up when the alert and that represents what it is. A green triangle, for example, for a test. But you're going to get a colored warning and more information around this. So the thing that really makes this slick is the being able to take this. Now, here's the interesting thing, too. When we realize this, you've got the you know, one side of the, or the edge of the thing with the EAS device, the DASDIC that we have, on one side being able to receive it, routing through and going to the transmitter. These things could be physically separated by miles or distance, depending on what you've got doing. In fact, in the video space, that's a lot of what we have with central casting and other things like that, where the device is in the, in the market, but the encoding and all the things that we do for the video space is in a central cast location many miles away. The other thing is, fold this together. If the DASDIC and the transmitter are in the same location, guess what? It could be, instead of a WAN, it's a LAN. And these things are linked together, actually co-located in such a way such that if we lost internet connection or anything else like that, those two devices can still work. We can still provide that level of EAS and information into the particular device. So the real thing is, these are the two edges, but if you look at those edges, it's really two devices. Again, the mic and the speaker. It's the camera and the, and the, the display monitor. It's the EAS device, the DASDEC, and the, and the Nautel GV transmitter all linked together to form this. Thanks, Bill. Um, so kind of stepping back for a second, uh, we, we dove into it. That's the solution. Let's go back and look at the, the, the basic concepts. Maybe we do this backwards. Look at the basic concepts and what are we trying to address here. Um, 
and you can spread up all the bullet points. I'm just going to uh, extemporaneous here. So virtualization has created a stir because it's had a couple of definitions. One is taking everything and putting it in the cloud. Another is abstracting the software and putting it on a server. And in both, ca both cases, there are serious challenges. Bill's mentioned the, abs you know, the abstraction of the hardware functionality. That's you know, physical reality. You have to have speakers, radio monitors, microphones, uh, et cetera. Um, there is uh, the regulatory barrier, and uh, that's an interesting one. Um, the, uh, would the FCC be amenable to essentially giving up its role regulating EAS device manufacturers? I don't think so. I honestly don't think so. Um, uh, the, uh, the other hidden ghost here is security. Um, we have been joyfully engaged both since the zombie attacks with a number of federal agencies, including the CISA, the Cybersecurity Information Security Agency, which is under DHS. DHS is like a mega corporation. They've got a dozen different agencies under it. Besides being involved with FEMA and FEMA and DHS SSD, there's DHS CISA, and they will very likely, my prediction, be involved in security requirements for EAS devices in the next five, five years or so. So there are a, a huge number of variables we started to think about in designing the solution. Um, bottom line, and we'll take up a lot of time with this, is that I think what we've come up here is an approach that delivers most, if not all, the benefits of virtualization without suffering the risks involved by going to a full abstracted software or a full cloud-based environment meeting FEMA's requirements, meeting the FCC's requirements, meeting CIS's requirements. It's kind of a, a trifecta win, if you will, in, in that approach. But uh, really the bottom line is, if you're looking at simplifying operations, uh, at rem and we'll get to this in a second, remote management, control, maintenance of the EAS footprint, especially in a, a very widely distributed uh, broadcast environment, we have, we're introducing tool sets to do that. So one of the key things, as Ed pointed out, is there are certain things, again, if you have multiples of these devices, you know, if I've got multiple EAS devices that are scattered around, how do I manage those? There's different things around it, and one of the things that, that we had developed is a mechanism we call Halo. It's a, a, a uh, a true virtualized solution where we're managing EAS devices. So we can set these things up to look at the devices and make sure the devices are operating correctly, backing up configurations, aggregating logs and everything. So when you have those NPTs that come up and you know have to have a lot of people look at all different logs, these can aggregate all of that information together. So managing these edge devices can be virtualized in a situation where we can gather information about what the devices are doing, finding out, making sure that they're operating correctly, that make sure that we've got the logs, the configurations, everything backed up. And that particular thing works very well because now I've got multiple people that may need to access that data. The engineering group, for example, is going to want to look and make sure the boxes are working. The compliance people are going to want to get the logs out so they can file their FCC reports. Other management may want to look at these things. So this does have this hybrid approach of not only the devices at the edge, but being able to manage them through virtualized software and elements like our Halo thing. So it is fully possible. It's available and it's available now. This is the thing. We're not trying to invent anything, but we've done and we've collaborated with Telos Alliance and with Nautel to bring this to a reality in the radio space. Let's go, let's go back for a second. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. And just to drive the point home, uh, the approaches we're talking about are things, are, are elements that we've deployed in the cable the IPTV, the broadcast television market for a decade or more. Where this, whether it's Halo, which two or three of the largest cable operators in the U.S. and most of the major cable operators in Canada already use Halo. Just not, I'm not, not a sales pitch, I'm not a sales guy, it's just a point of fact that it's proven. The remote maintenance operation, log gatherance, compliance reporting for hundreds of sites for one operation. So one major cable operator with hundreds of sites administers all this from their Halo console, gathers all the logs, does their joyful ETRS reporting, 
uh, literally uh, reduces their, some of their costs by up to a million dollars in ETS or ETRS reporting just through that one function. Talk about return on investment right there. Um, and again, in IPTV, what we've learned in IPTV, what we've learned in public safety, what we've learned in cable operations, all now migrating it to the radio sector. So again, um, I will use a hyperbole. I really do think this is a revolutionary approach, bringing EAS processes into the interconnected AOIP world. We're extending the benefits of virtualization to distributed edge environments. We're removing cascading layers of hardware multiple boxes with an intelligent one-to-many approach. So think about that. With Nortel and Telos and Digital Earth System, we're minimizing that hardware footprint. We're minimizing the number of interconnected devices and dramatically simplifying the workflows, the, uh, the, the data flows, and the maintenance uh, implications. Also, making things simple, doing all this within a framework that is FCC compliant, within the Part 11, Part 15 rules, Part 79 rules we all have to adhere to. So plug and play with existing rules from the FCC and expectations from FEMA. And again, redundant, proven and su successfully deployed in video environments in multiple countries for years. Great. So we want to open it up for, a, we got a little bit of time if there's some specific questions or anything that uh, we have. Got one right in front. Here, here. See if we can. Jeff, I'll get the, the microphone to you. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually for the benefit oh, of everybody yeah. else to hear. Of course. You. So, um, when will this virtualized stuff be ready? Because um, I got nine stations in Alaska that have gotten quotes for $6,200 a piece to get their units upgraded, replaced. If we don't have to do that, why? Let's ha let's get the virtualized and, and screw the hardware, right? Well, I mean, you know, this is like ridiculous. We just we're small stations. This is a lot of money, and we're not compliant. And the one that can be upgraded has to be sent back to you guys to upgrade, and we will be without EAS until it comes back. That's not a good system. Yeah, agreed. I mean, part of the stuff around, again, we've got to have the, those edge devices. We've got to have the devices that, that are, are grabbing the off-air signals, decoding the logic, looking at the other parts to make sure what needs to play out. So that's, again, that, that first side of it is really still needs to be there to be able to then get it into the format that we need for the rest of the air chain. So it's not ready yet, I mean, what, commercially. No, it, I mean, the thing is, for, for what we're doing today and what we're showcasing in this particular environment, we've got a couple of things that we're, we're not ready to ship. Okay, this I just want to know if we got to spend the $6,200 per station now, or should we wait, or will you accept a trade-in? Well, and part <laughs> I mean, of the stuff know, is what, what, what you have today can be upgraded to this. And then we can, and then we'll leave without it. No, the boxes I have, I've got all these emails that say, nope, can't do it. Those boxes aren't compliant. You'll never upgrade those. That's why we're buying these new ones. I mean, it's insane. Well, I mean, uh, I would encourage you to come and talk to yeah. us yeah, for, for details on that. Because again, some, some of the things, our, our very older systems, which were 32-bit, uh, you know, as we had to migrate into the 64-bit world and everything else, that might be one of the things. So we'd love to talk to you more in detail about that and, and showcase it. Alaska's always been the edge case, the hard case, so this is, um, let's sit down and talk about it. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, I love the idea of being able to, uh, we don't use PPM in Alaska, I mean, we don't even know, I mean, I don't think they even know we exist in Nielsen. But anyway, um, if you can suppress the PPM, right, that's great, but what about if you have a downstream station and your daisy chain relay, um, in Alaska the internet goes out a lot, so you don't get the cap, do, do, do the stations that are commercial, like maybe in Anchorage, do they end up broadcasting the downstream station's PPM? Well, because I mean, they don't suppress it. Yeah. So, so basically it would be the case that if, if the station that you're listening to has PPM, what you don't want to do is, is put the PPM on top of it with that. Yeah. Right. You'll get theirs and that's what you do. During the EAS, you just want to disable it so that you, you only pass one. Yeah. You still get theirs. Exactly. For the EAS alert. For the EAS. Then it flips back. Yeah. Then it flips back to your, your programming. Yeah. Exactly. Any other questions? I don't see if there's anything. 
nonetheless, uh, obviously what we encourage you guys is uh, uh, see us on the show floor. Uh, this is an active demo. We're showing this in both uh, our booth at W3920 uh, and the Nautel booth, which is pretty close at W3042. Uh, uh, um, you'll be able to see it. In fact, it's very nice. The Nautel guys actually have, you know, spinning lights and everything else and a button to press and you can actually watch it in action. Uh, on including the vids graphics and the RDS stuff on a display. So appreciate it. Thank you very much for your uh, opportunity to speak with you today. Look forward to talking Thank to you. Thank you.